I'm sure you've seen the headlines. Ultra processed foods linked to 32 health problems. Ultra processed foods have disturbing effect. Ultra processed foods linked to 32 harmful effects to health. Ultra processed foods linked to early death mental disorders. Full list of dangers from popular ultra processed foods. Ultra processed foods increases risks of cancer, diabetes, and depression. First, these sensationalized headlines don't accurately represent what this new and important study actually showed. And second, the articles themselves don't accurately summarize the study while presenting solutions that are just, well, they're bad takes. A number of news articles, like this one from The Guardian, suggested that we should regulate and label ultra-processed foods the same way we do tobacco products, implying that ultra-processed foods are as damaging to our health as cigarettes. They're not. And this article from CNN suggests that it's simple to avoid ultra-processed foods. Just buy real food and cook it at home. Like, oh my gosh, CNN, what a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? The problem with such terrible news coverage of an important study is that people are either freaking out or checking out. So let's do what none of these news articles have done. Let's dig into this new study, look at what it actually shows, and put it in the context of the field of research as a whole. And let's start by talking about what ultra-processed foods even are. The NOVA classification system categorizes foods based on the extent and purpose of their processing. Developed by researchers, the NOVA classification divides foods into four groups. Unprocessed or minimally processed foods, processed culinary ingredients, processed foods, and ultra-processed foods. The distinction between groups lies in the degree of industrial processing and the use of additives. Group one includes unprocessed foods, meaning natural whole ingredients. Think raw carrots, apples, or berries. And minimally processed foods, which can include, for example, removal of inedible parts, drying, crushing, cooking without added ingredients, freezing or pasteurization. Think peeling a banana, roasting a chicken, freezing broccoli, or unsalted shelled mixed nuts. That reminds me of a joke. Why did the banana go see the doctor? because it wasn't peeling well. <laughs> I hope that mom joke earned your subscribe. Group two, processed culinary ingredients, includes substances that are extracted from whole foods, like cooking oils. And group three, processed foods, involve cooking or preservation methods for culinary purposes. Examples would include white rice or all-purpose flour, or canned vegetables and fish. This type of processing can remove some, but not all of the inherent nutrients. And importantly, many processed foods are nutritious options and can even count as whole foods. And finally, group four, ultra processed foods are made mostly or entirely of ingredients extracted from whole foods through a series of industrial processes and techniques. The more the ingredients of a food are processed and refined, the more nutrients are degraded and ultimately stripped out of the resulting food. So one of the things that ultra processed foods all have in common, besides being super convenient and addictively delicious, is they tend to have very little to offer us in terms of essential nutrients, unless they've been fortified. Examples of ultra processed foods include soft drinks, packaged salty snacks, energy drinks, candy, packaged bread and cookies, cake and cake mixes, margarines and other spreads, sweetened breakfast cereal, deli meats, American cheese, hot dogs, uh, fish or chicken nuggets, instant soups, and regular pasta noodles. The NOVA classification is used in these types of scientific studies that are looking to evaluate the role that ultra-processed foods have in our overall health. But I want to emphasize that lots of foods fall into the group three NOVA classification of processed foods that have lots of nutritive value and a wealth of scientific studies showing health benefits. So let's dig into this new study, look at what it actually shows and how it aligns with previous research. First of all, this is the largest meta-analysis to date evaluating the health impact of diets overabundant in ultra-processed foods. The review looked at 32 different health outcomes, 13 of which included both a dose response and comparing high versus low ultra-processed food consumption. And the remaining 19 only looked at high versus low ultra-processed food consumption. And this is the graphic summary of the results. 
It makes it look like all 32 health outcomes were linked to ultra-processed food intake. But if you look closely, all of the results are coded based on whether or not there was a link and the quality of evidence for that link. For nine out of the 32 outcomes, there was strong evidence, which the authors grade as highly suggestive or convincing of a link to ultra-processed food intake. This includes all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease-related mortality, heart disease-related mortality, type 2 diabetes, anxiety, depression, common mental disorders, sleep problems, and wheezing. This study showed that high ultra-processed food consumption was strongly linked to just nine health outcomes. And for 10 of the 32 outcomes, there was no link with ultra-processed food intake. This included cancer mortality, breast cancer, central nervous system cancer, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, asthma, high serum triglycerides, ulcerative colitis, and hyperglycemia, high blood sugars. So much for the headlines that say this study linked ultra-processed food intake to cancer. I mean, did you even read the study? I mean, I, I know the answer is no. For the remaining 13 outcomes, there was weak evidence of a link, including for cancer overall, colorectal cancer, cardiovascular disease events, cardiovascular disease morbidity, high blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, the, the good cholesterol, Crohn's disease, abdominal obesity, metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, overweight, obesity, and overweight plus obesity. These are all the health outcomes for which we need more studies, more data to determine whether and how there is a link between these health problems and ultra-processed food intake. Also, does anyone else think it's disingenuous to call obesity, overweight, and overweight plus obesity three different health outcomes? Let's put this research into the context of the field of study and discuss what's actually new here. Other meta-analyses have shown that the more ultra-processed foods we eat, the higher our risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality. So I think one of the potentially more important new findings from this study is the link between ultra-processed food intake and mental health challenges, including anxiety, depression, and sleep problems. But really importantly, a causal relationship is not established by this study. And it's absolutely possible that people with anxiety or depression seek out ultra-processed foods because they crave them or because they don't take much time and energy to prepare, rather than ultra-processed food intake contributing to the development of their mental health challenges. Even though this study does not establish a causal link, there are some other studies we can look at that can help to explain why this link between ultra-processed food intake and adverse health outcomes exists. A 2021 meta-analysis showed that the more ultra-processed food we eat, the lower our intake of fiber, protein, potassium, zinc, magnesium, vitamin A, vitamin B3, vitamin B12, vitamin C, vitamin D, and vitamin E. In fact, the only nutrients whose intake was not significantly impacted by what percentage of the diet was taken up by ultra-processed foods were iron, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin B1, vitamin B2, and sodium. And the people who were eating the most ultra-processed foods were only getting about 60% of the daily value for fiber, magnesium, vitamin A, and vitamin E. Basically, ultra-processed foods have fewer nutrients than whole foods. And when we consume too many ultra-processed foods, this can lead to a nutrient insufficient diet. And I talked about nutrient insufficiency and how it can harm our health in a previous video. Make sure to go check it out. And here's where the news coverage on this study super irks me. Articles summarizing the study typically don't address that ultra-processed foods are more affordable and more accessible than whole foods. On average, ultra-processed foods are 52% cheaper than their minimally processed counterparts. Combined with being more readily available, convenient, and addictively delicious, no wonder 58% of the calories consumed in the USA are coming from ultra-processed foods. Plus, there are socioeconomic and demographic disparities here, with ultra-processed food intake being on average higher in non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, less educated, younger, and lower income people. 
It's worth noting that what the authors of this study actually recommended was economic policies that make fresh and minimally processed foods more accessible and affordable. And that in addition to strategies like uh, front of the package labeling, stakeholders need to be responsive and sensitive to factors that influence access to fresh produce and food choices, including the relatively greater time, effort, and cost of preparing non-ultra processed foods. Yes, news outlets, that should be the take home message here. This study should not be used to shame people for choosing more accessible, more affordable, convenient foods that are engineered to be hyper palatable. And choosing ultra processed foods should not be simplified to just buy real foods and cook it at home, CNN. Like it's all just a matter of willpower and we all have equal access to whole foods. Seriously, that was the worst take. Instead, this study emphasizes the importance of systemically addressing the affordability and accessibility of fresh, whole, and minimally processed foods. And look, I'm not here to defend ultra-processed foods. I'm here to defend people who can only afford them or who rely on them because they're quick and easy to prepare. And if you have the time, energy, and money to reduce your ultra-processed food intake. It's also important to emphasize that this study does not in any way suggest we need to eliminate ultra-processed foods completely in order to avoid these negative health outcomes. I discussed a couple of studies showing the cusp for the negative impact of ultra-processed food consumption being about 20% of our total calories or more in my video on how any food can fit into a healthy diet. But to review, this data comes from a 2022 study out of the UK, which followed 60,000 people over the age of 40 for an average of 10 years. This study showed that people who got 43% of their calories or more from ultra processed foods had a 17% higher risk of cardiovascular disease and a 22% higher risk of total mortality compared to people who got 20.8% of the calories from ultra processed foods or less after accounting for age, sex, race and ethnicity, smoking, BMI, physical activity, education, alcohol intake, and diet quality. Plus, not all ultra processed foods are equally problematic. Hashtag not all ultra processed foods, am I right? A 2022 meta-analysis showed that while sugar sweetened beverages, artificially sweetened beverages, and processed meats all increased all-cause mortality, breakfast cereals in general were associated with lower mortality. The people who consumed the most breakfast cereals had a 15% reduced risk of all-cause mortality compared to people who rarely ate breakfast cereals. And yes, that statistics includes all breakfast cereals, from Fruity Pebbles to All Bran. Now, those who mainly consumed whole grain breakfast cereals actually had a 23% reduced risk of all-cause mortality, and those who mainly consumed sugary breakfast cereals actually had no change in all-cause mortality. This may reflect the fortification of breakfast cereals, making them have more to offer nutritionally than other ultra-processed foods, like a can of soda, in addition to the fiber content of whole grain breakfast cereals. Certainly, more research is needed to know which ultra-processed foods should be reduced versus which get a pass. Instead of restricting ultra processed food intake, we just want to reduce it from the average of 58% in the typical American's diet to about 20%, the level that large prospective studies show poses no health harm. And again, emphasizing if this is accessible to you. This is sometimes referred to as the 80-20 rule, and it's a good way to enjoy our favorite foods in moderation while ensuring that the overall quality of our diets is high. A fair interpretation of the current scientific evidence is that if 80% of your calories are coming from whole and minimally processed foods, contributing a meaningful amount of essential nutrients to your overall diet, then there's no health harm from the remaining 20% of your calories that come from ultra processed foods, like packaged cookies, pizza, or, or cake. So a great way to go here is to focus on 80% of our calories coming from whole and minimally processed foods. And then foods we choose because they stretch our budget or save time or are just plain tasty. Whatever we want, even ultra processed foods can fit into the remaining 20%. So let's wrap up by talking just a little bit more about how to identify ultra processed foods versus whole foods. One way to look at this is to ask whether or not most of the inherent nutrients in that food remain intact. For example, processing an apple into applesauce retains most of the nutrition. But when you further process that into apple juice, now you're starting to lose some of the essential nutrients inherent to apples. 
And a great tool for evaluating this is the Nutrivore score, a measurement of total nutrients per calorie. I talked in depth about the Nutrivore score in a previous video, so make sure to go check that out. Another way to look at this is, could I make this at home with ingredients that are natural or close to their natural state? If the answer is yes, we call that a whole food. But when in doubt, don't overthink it. The most important thing to know here is that the sensationalized headlines are clickbaiting you with fear. Only nine health problems were strongly linked to ultra processed food intake. And the study does not establish causality. But this is a really important study adding to the growing body of scientific research showing that the way that ultra processed foods are dominating our food supply and our diets is contributing to the high rates of health problems we see today. It's a call to action to systemically address the accessibility and affordability of nutritious foods. And when we put this study into the context of the research as a whole, the 80-20 rule still stands.